Out of the dark blue green sea emerged many millions of years ago an amphibious creature that approached the earth, came ashore, and after an evolution of another series of millions of years, turned into a mammal and eventually turned into a humanoid. The greatest achievement of these humanoids, of these human beings, was the creation of cities. This is now universally recognized. And one of the first cities that was established was in Phoenicia, Byblos specifically, out of which we Greeks uh, inherited the beginnings of our alphabet, the production of olives, our enjoyment of wine, and Byblos and the urban civilization that it founded spread across the Mediterranean to Cairo, to Alexandria, to Carthage, to Barcelona, to Marseille, over to my ancestral city, Constantinople. And on the route, we recognize certain realities about the evolution of cities. For example, the city in southeastern Anatolia, which is called Katal Huyuk, established 8,000 years ago and a stable urban settlement for 1,200 years. And significantly, let us note, it was an urban settlement without a hierarchy, without domination internally, a center of hunter-gatherer convergence. But along the road, there was a break with nature. The urban settlements gradually separated themselves from nature. And the great ecologist, Murray Bookchin, one of the greatest philosophers of ecologists in our uh, world of universal knowledge, said that there was a breakdown in the original organic societies. So that here we have, for example, an, exam an instance where cities have grown so large, this is Mumbai in India, this is New York City at five o'clock in the morning, that's why there aren't so many people in the street. There was a breakdown between urbanization and nature. And as a result of this breakdown, a number of very significant problems emerged, ecological problems. So that here, for example, in a part of Brooklyn in New York, you find a cesspool. You find the most disgusting, ugly form of ecological deterioration. Uh, you can't believe the consequences of air and water pollution. You can't believe the degree of the breakdown in public transportation systems in North America the enormous housing crisis, not only in North America, but also in Latin America, not only in Latin America, but also here on the continent of Europe, and not only, of course, in Europe, but also in Greece. Here is an example of what we have returned to nature. This is an enormous multi-kilometer spread of garbage that is choking the life out of the Pacific Ocean. All of this is plastic, all of this is refuge that, cannot be, that has not been recycled, and it's choking the life of the source of our life, the, the oceans. And Murray Bookchin clearly illustrated in his many, many works that the ecological crisis is really a reflection of a social crisis, a social crisis to be found centered in our cities. By social crisis, we mean a urban environment which is dominated by exploitation and domination, where the 1% choke the life out of the 99%, where there is sexism, where there is ageism, where there is xenophobia, 
where there is homelessness, whether there is poverty. Here's an example of Rio, which is a city, a rich city, with all these five and four star hotels completely surrounded by poverty, by the favelas. And the favelas are not passive anymore. They are resisting and they are beginning to fight back. And that's what I want to move towards. I want to bring to your attention the birth of a citizen's movement that is saying, no, this is enough. We're not going to take it anymore. The cities belong to us and we're going to take back the cities. And this is a very significant change that has taken place because in 2007, ladies and gentlemen, the United Nations declared that the majority of human beings now live in cities. So the political equation, the economic equation, has really been transformed. Cities now play a dominant role, the 60 major cities in the world play a dominant role in the world economy. They determine the nature of industry, the nature of commerce, the nature of international trade. They are elements in a completely new political, social, cultural, and economic mosaic. And in that crisis is born this new citizens movement called the right to the city. And that's what I'd like to address with you. These are people who have found it impossible to live comfortably in cities. And out of this contradiction, we have the emergence of some very important thinkers, some very important writers, like the next slide that brings us to the attention of Henri Lefebvre, a very famous uh, uh, Parisian uh, analyst and theorist, and the emergence of the idea that the city really belongs to its citizens. If we can move into the next slide, you will be able to see my country, my city, Montreal. And there, this citizens movement took a direction, a pioneering direction, which is quite remarkable. We, um, in 1968, in this city of 5,000 restaurants, the city of w international recognition as being a city of joy, of multicultural interaction, a city that uses many human languages, uh, although it is principally a French language and a bilingual city. In this city, we created a citizens association. This is my neighborhood, Milton Park, where we decided to take on a major speculator who bought a, over a number of years a six block area uh, in the downtown of the city, that's the center of the city, wanted to expand the uh, center of the city towards the north and they wanted to completely demolish the whole neighborhood of heritage Victorian gray stones uh, and to completely destroy that whole area and to build the so-called city of the 21st century. And we said no. And we said no with great deal of conviction. Here are some of the examples of the architecture that I was talking to you about. Beautiful buildings. That one over there on the right actually happened to be <laughs> the Russian consulate uh, before the October Revolution in Russia. A magnificent structure. We saved it and we saved the whole neighborhood by saying no. And how did we say no? Over an 11 year, 11 year period, we squatted, we had demonstrations, we had public information center uh, sessions, uh, we occupied the offices of the developer, we were arrested, I was one of the 59 people who was arrested, we were taken to jail, we had a magnificent trial, very fair trial, where we brought tremendous experts before us, and we were found not guilty. We were, not, we were found not guilty because the court, the jury, decided that we had the perfect right to fight to save our neighborhood. And we created, we created the largest nonprofit cooperative housing project in North America, consisting of 
642 housing units. There is our victory celebration with over a thousand residents being democratic participants in the project. And there at the extreme right, you see a postage stamp issued by Canada Post celebrating our, our, our people's victory. And what is significant also about this project is that we own the land in common. There's no private ownership and therefore there's no speculation. It is not possible to buy and sell property within the six block area. And so we set an example uh, in Montreal, in Canada and in North America of what people power can do. And it is recognized as a major accomplishment because it is encapsulated within a democratic sensibility of citizen participation. Can you imagine having assemblies of many hundreds of people participating in the urban planning of their environment, of um, the use of green spaces, of green roofs, of issues of traffic circulation, of quality of housing, and so on and so forth. All of that was made possible by the development of a, a sense of democratic citizenship and participation. And that led, as the, these ideas grew out, that led to our influencing of our city administration, of our city hall. We established en route this very important institution, the Urban Ecology Center in 1996, which I founded um, in the center of the Milton Park area. We influence the city to adopt the Montreal Charter of Rights and Responsibilities, which recognizes the human rights that we have within our own city. What are our rights in the area of housing, of transportation, democratic participation, of water, of culture, of social activities, of environmental policies, all of that is a law, an urban law, under our city. And this has now been celebrated by UNESCO in Paris. It has been duplicated in Mexico City, in Guangzhou, in South Korea, and other cities throughout the world. There are world summits now that take place around the whole idea of citizen rights and responsibilities. And so it is very illustrative of the fact that Montreal has set an example that is now being duplicated elsewhere. And it has affected society in general. It has radiated out outwards this democratic desire for people to take their destiny into their own hands. And it has led to a new generation of student activists so that today we have hundreds of thousands of students throughout Quebec, throughout Montreal, who are demonstrating uh, for free public education all the way up to and including the university, who have a social agenda, who stand to defend the rights of poor people, to stand in the defense of people who are discriminated in any way, and who are then supported by the general population that comes out every evening at eight o'clock and bangs its kettles and its pots in support of these mass demonstrations which have led to the defeat of two regional governments. So it's not just occupying the street. It actually has serious political consequences. And all of these thousands and thousands and thousands of young people uh, who have taken their society and their city into their hands, all of them make their important decisions through democratic assemblies where everything is discussed and made me think of our own ecclesia, our own agora, and how our ancestors, through tremendous debate, through tremendous egalitarian discussion, undertook to make the most serious decisions of the future of their cities. This one in particular, Athens, Corinth, and many other Greek cities, and set an example to the world. That's what came out of the Maple Spring. So history repeats often its bad examples, but often it repeats its best examples. And this is a repetition of that kind of best example. 
Let me say this in conclusion. We now face a monumental crisis called climate change. There is no slide here because that's how dark our future is. Climate change affecting the whole planet. And what do some of the key actors in climate change tell us? Al Gore, former Vice President of the United States, no less, made an extraordinary documentary called, as you know, The Unconventional Truth. He traced the entire impact of the environmental crisis. And if you remember, at the very end of the documentary, he says, I don't have much faith that the solution is going to come from national governments, it's going to come from cities. And the current General Secretary of the United Nations, just two years ago, in front of the World Urban Forum in Naples, where I participated, <coughs> said exactly the same thing. So let me conclude by saying, we as human beings, we as citizens, must take back our cities, away from the 1%, back to the 99%, and I say to you in conclusion, all power to the people. <laughs>